with which we must constantly collaborate in order to deliver to every person residing within the borders of Trinidad and Tobago the highest possible quality of mental health care. Mental health is everyone's business. So I invite you all on Sunday to wear something green in recognition of World Mental Health Day. Everyone is encouraged to learn more about mental health and to use the knowledge gained to combat stigma and to promote healthier societal attitudes towards those whose lives have been affected by mental health disorders. Let's continue to work together to make mental health care a reality for all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Othello. Minister Dial Singh will now provide us with the latest vaccination uptake figures and other important issues impacting the national vaccination campaign. Minister. Thank you very much, Al. Good morning to the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Parashram. Good morning to Dr. Yuzlo Othello, ladies and gentlemen of the media, and viewers and, listening and listeners wherever you are. Uh, good Wednesday morning to you. Um, my purpose here this morning is twofold. One, bring you up to date on the vaccination figures, the numbers, what do the numbers mean? What trends are we seeing? And two, to officially launch the TT safe zone concept, um, inclusive of the poster evidence that needs to be displayed prominently at the entrances of um, establishments who wish to participate in a safe zone um, concept moving forward. So what are the raw vaccination numbers as we move forward? As of last night, 588,038 persons have received their first shots, um, which represents 42% of the population. Second shots, inclusive of the Johnson Johnson one shot and done, 525,220 persons, which represents 37.5% of the population. The 12 to 18 school population, first dose, 44,677. And of that, 32,187 32, have received their second dose, so roughly 32,000, depending on when they received their second dose. If it's two weeks ago and further, they are now considered fully vaccinated. If it's less than two weeks, they are on their way to be fully vaccinated. Last week, Monday, I would have reported to the country that we started to see an uptick of about 50% in the number of vaccines um, administered. And you may recall, it would have been mentioned, that very often when we start off a Monday of any week at a given number, prior to last week, Monday, that the numbers tend to tail off Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and into the weekends. I am happy to report that from last week, Monday, which was the 27th of September, to yesterday, Tuesday, 6 October, for the first time in many weeks, we have seen no tapering off of that demand. From Monday, 27 September to last night, we would have administered 20,831 first shots. This, these, are, these are particularly good numbers in that the pace was maintained, which was what we were hoping for. When you include the one shot and done into that, for the same period, we did 6,182. So when you combine those two, you get 27,013. What does that mean? It means that between first doses and J&J &J one shot and done, 27,013 people are on their way, have started this journey a very good journey to become fully vaccinated. It means an additional 27,000 persons, once they complete the second dose of their two-dose regime and wait two weeks, 
and or for the Johnson & Johnson two weeks after, it means possibly 27,000 less persons to become severely ill from COVID. 27,000 persons may not need a ICU or HDU bed, which is in short and limited supply. And it means these persons stand over a 99% chance of not dying from COVID. These, these people who have followed those who have gone before all need to be congratulated for taking this step to be responsible not only to themselves, but to their families, their communities, to their co-workers and society at large. Because when you protect yourself, you also protect those around you. So I really want to salute all 525,220 persons who can be considered to be fully vaccinated. You are doing a wonderful job, and let's encourage more and more persons to become vaccinated. In the coming days, you will see hopefully, a sharp rise in the number of second doses being given out. Why? Because now we are moving into that six-week phase where six weeks ago we gave out large amounts of the AstraZeneca. And we started that second dose uh, regime last week and in earnest on Monday of this week. For the same period, Monday 27 September to last night, Tuesday 6 October, we would have done 38,830 second doses, the bulk of which are between Pfizer and um, AstraZeneca. And we still continue to roll around with uh, Sinopharm between first and second shots over 1,000 a day. So it means that the population <clears throat> who were waiting for some reason to be vaccinated, are coming out to be vaccinated. The levels which we saw last week, Monday, have been maintained. The outreach activities we are doing, whether it's in Marabella, whether it's in Sangre Grande, Brian Lara Promenade, are all going well. This weekend coming up, if all things go according to plan, we are shifting the focus now to about three or four main areas for outreach activities. They will be Arima, Shogonas, Kuva, and um, I have it here, Kweze San Juan, that's in my constituency. We are also doing one in Diego Martin Community Center, Arima, Center City Mall, Trin City Mall, Princess Town Promenade, the triangle in Princess Town. Venture Credit Union, Ram Singh's Music World Car Park, Kuva Main Road. So we are shifting to other major population centers that, high, that have high foot traffic to take advantage of people shopping, getting vaccinated. That has proven to be a worthwhile effort. So this is the one shot and done vaccination drive this weekend. It will be published as usual. Um, so thanks to all the partners who are assisting us with that. So that's the vaccination update. Last word on vaccination, ladies and gentlemen. Whilst there can be some measure of um, relief that more persons are getting vaccinated, there are two statistics that continue to bother us at health. And we started to include one in our 4 p.m. update. And I want the persons who are thinking hard about making that decision to be vaccinated to pay attention to these facts. Percentage of patients in the parallel healthcare system who are not fully vaccinated. 3,050 out of 3,193. It means the vast, vast majority, 3,050 out of 3,193 
which is 95.5%, based on data from July 22nd to September 16, are not fully vaccinated. It means the parallel healthcare system, the step down facilities, are being populated by the unvaccinated. And what is even more sad is that by now we should have had no person or literally very little number of deaths due to COVID-19. Why? Because once you are fully vaccinated, you stand, see, is it 99? Under 99? A little under 99% chance of not dying from COVID. But yet every day we're still getting these deaths. So we continue to share the information, make vaccines easily available, and we ask persons to get vaccinated. My second reason for being here, as I indicated, was to officially launch the Safe Zone, TT Safe Zone um, poster, sticker. The Honorable Attorney General would have officially given the, the position at last Saturday's press conference. This program kicks in on Monday, the 11th of October, which is next Monday. So let's run through some slides and we'll take our time with it. Thank you. So we are going to be talking TT safe zone. Next slide, please. The types of establishments, as we have been saying, will be restaurants, bars, a common gaming house, bed and pool or office, but you must be licensed under the Gambling and Betting Act, a cinema theatre, licensed under the cinema, Cinematograph Act, <laughs> a private members club, licensed under the Registration of Clubs Act, a theatre under the Theatre and Dance Halls Act, Gyms and fitness studios, which will give us, Dr. Othello, a great degree of mental health relief. And water parks. The water parks have been closed for a long time. I think it is time to open them back. What are the rules or the requirements for the safe zone? We have certain conditions for employees, certain conditions for patrons. As we have indicated and signaled over a month ago, all employees must be fully vaccinated. A person is considered to be fully vaccinated two weeks after receiving the final recommended vaccine dose. So if it's a one shot and done, two weeks after that one shot. Or if you're on a two dose regime, two weeks after your second shot of a WHO approved vaccine or WHO approved vaccine combination and the CMO will go into details on what those vaccine combinations are. For employees and employers, copies of the vaccination cards must be kept on the premises for inspection and these copies must be available for inspection by the authorities. What are the rules for patrons? So if you're going to a cinema, going to have an evening out and eat out, going to a casino, going to a gym, going to a water park, you must be fully vaccinated. And I have given you the conditions. You must have proof of vaccination and one form of valid photo ID on your person. Okay? Next slide, please. We have made provisions for exemptions and deferrals. The CMO, once I am through here, will go into much more detail on how a person can be exempted or get a deferral. So he will go into much more detail on that. So if an employee wants to be medically exempted or get a deferral or a patron wants to come in with a medical exemption or medical deferral, there are certain um, parameters under which that can be done, and the CMO will go into, detail, into details on that. 
Next slide, please. What if there is a breach of the TT safe zone policy? There will be fines for either the owner, operator and or the patron. There will be fixed penalty tickets for breaches under the regulations. After three breaches, owners and operators may be prohibited from operating as a safe zone. So you could go back to operating for takeout only as you see fit. Breach by an employee. The owner or the operator is fined $25,000 per breach because this is the owner's responsibility to make sure that the employee is fully vaccinated. And breach by a patron, again, the owner or operator is fined $25,000 per breach and the individual patron. So if I'm a patron and I go into a safe zone, Without my vaccination card, I will be fined $5,000. If anyone has a complaint or a concern or a query, there's an email address that you could email your complaint, concern or query to it. Next slide, please. So this is what the actual poster will look like. Is it TT safe zone? Everything which I just said is on it, so no need to go it through again. The question is being asked, does a owner operator have to apply to the ministry to become a TTZ zone participant? The answer is no. There is no application process. There is no application fee. It is simply a certificate which you download from any of the following sites and it will be available from tomorrow. The Communications Office of the Prime Minister, the website of the Ministry of Trade and Industry, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Tourism, Culture and the Arts, TT Connect, iGov under the Ministry of Digital Transformation. It will also be sent to all Chambers of Commerce from today I have already spoken to the Bar Owners Association. I will send it to them so they could disseminate to their members. I have already spoken to a member or two who represent the casino industry. It will be sent to them, food and beverage. So we are trying to make this as e administratively easy as possible. Let me repeat, there is no registration process. Once you display this, you are agreeing to all the terms and conditions under the safe zone concept. We ask that you display it prominently so both patrons, employees and inspectors can see it near your entrance or whatever. You could probably display some other copies inside. This is downloadable. It is going to be freely available. No application fee, no application process. So this is the TT safe zone concept. That is the poster you will be asked to display. And before we go back to Al for questions, I will ask the CMO now to go into details about what a medical exemption is and what a medical deferral is for either employees and or patrons. Thank you very much, Al. Okay, thank you, Minister. So if I could have the first slide related to medical de deferral certificate, we'll go into a little detail with both of them. So this is what it will look like. Um, so it's a medical deferral certificate that says on the top of it, as the physician will declare that they have examined a certain person at their particular clinic, um, you have to present at that point in time some form of ID to the individual, whether it's the national ID, driver's permit, passport, or any other document that identifies you as the person in front of the physician. On that particular day, you declare that that person has some sort of deferral, and I'll go into a little detail in the second slide as to what it means. And just to bear on the bottom left-hand corner, the doctor's signature, the medical board registration of the physician, as well as a public health facility stamp is there as well. Next slide. So the guidelines for a deferral certificate is basically it is issued on a temporary basis. So it means it's for a fixed period of time, it will expire after which time you can or you are deemed that you can receive the vaccine. 
So eligible persons, those with medical conditions which hinder them from receiving all COVID-19 vaccines for a fixed period of time, for example. So we're saying all in there because there are some people that can't have, for example, Pfizer for some reason or the other, but they can't have Sinopharm. So the physician will have to determine that that person, for whatever reason, cannot have all of the COVID-19 vaccines available in the country for a given period of time. Some examples are, one, had COVID-19 within the last three months. So as you know, the policy for COVID-19 vaccination post-COVID-19 is that you have to wait three months for now. Um, and of course, get clearance from your physician if you have long COVID. A second example is if you're in the first trimester of pregnancy. As you know, the, the Pfizer is, is allowed for pregnancy, but after the second and third trimester only. As an acute medical condition, such as a viral illness or gastroenteritis, in which case you could get a shorter deferral period, maybe for a couple of weeks, until your symptoms settle, and then you get um, have the ability to take the vaccine. Any other medical condition which require a specialist approval, and we are asking for those particular conditions that those individuals go to a specialist clinic where you are seeking medical care. Next slide. So this one is, looks almost the same. It's a medical exemption certificate. The only difference really is that you will see on the bottom of it, in the middle of it, with effect from and continuing. So generally speaking, there's no end date to our exemption certificate. It means and it implies that it's a semi-permanent condition that allows, that, that says that you can't have the vaccination. If you could go to the other slide, please. Yeah, so semi-permanent certificates exempts the patient from taking, again, all COVID-19 vaccines available at this point in time and continuing forward. Meaning if you have this exemption certificate in place for the workplace, it also applies for travel. It means that you can't have the vaccine continuously unless maybe another type of vaccine comes into the country or you are given a certificate from your physician saying that the, the condition no, no longer exists so you could actually have a vaccine. The last bit is again eligible to persons who have contraindications to all COVID-19 vaccines and to those who have other medical conditions which require a specialist approval. And again, we um, for cancer patients, for example, um, persons with acquired immune deficiency syndrome, we ask that you go to those particular clinics where you normally seek your clear to get your certificates from the specialists involved. Um, next, next slide, please. So, and that that is just reiterated here in the first bullet for persons who belong to a specialist clinic. You go to the relevant clinics that you attend. Only physicians in the public sector are allowed to complete these certificates. Private physicians are not allowed at this time to complete the certificates or we won't accept it from the private sector. It must be a stamp of the, the, the physician is attached to a particular institution. It must be the stamp of that medical institution on it and his or her medical registration number as well. Last slide. So the last bit I have written to the CEOs on this and spoken to them. They are expected to have these certificates available to everyone from Friday 8th of October at the local health centers and hospital specialist clinics. I think that is the end of my presentation now for, as it relates to exemptions. Thank you very much, CMO, and of course, Minister. As we transition to the question and answer segment, we ask our media representatives to please state your name and the name of your media hall before posing your two brief questions and kindly identify the panelists to whom you wish to address each question. We will take our first question from Guardian Media Limited. Hi, good morning, everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. Okay, so my mm -hmm. two questions this morning are for the Minister of Health and the CMO. Firstly, Minister, um, we're hearing word that some volunteers who might have volunteered early on in the vaccination program may not have been paid. They were prom promised some sort of payment. Uh, would you be willing to iterate a bit more on that? And secondly, as it comes to the safe zone, uh, how would business owners and even the enforcement officers and them know whether a immunization card is fake or not? Will they be trained for this? And as it pertains to the exemption, is it that someone who wants to have that exemption or deferral needs to go to, say, a hospital or a health center within the public sector mm -hmm. to get that? Thank you. Okay. So let's take your last question. I think the CMO just explained in, in very fine detail who gives the exemption 
maybe he can repeat himself. Mm -hmm. On the issue of the safe zones, um, you'll have to repeat the question. On the question of payments, I will have to check on that. If you send me the information, as we always say, we will look at it. Just repeat your question on the safe zone, please, Richard. Um, the first part of the question was, how would someone, be it a business owner or even the enforcement officers on them, know whether a uh, immunization card is fake okay. or not? Are they going right. to be trained? Thanks. Yeah. So they will, they will, be, they will be trained and, and be um, alerted to as to what to look for in the vaccination cards. And what we'll be doing with this spot checking is take some of that data and match it back to our database. Right, and that is how we will um, determine whether um, that is true or false. And there are stiff penalties for if anyone produces, as I explained, a false vaccination card. And you can also be charged under the forgery act. Okay, so I hope that answers your question, Richard. Thank you. You want to yeah, explain so, the exemption no, again? Just, so just again, um, for clarity, from Friday morning these exemption or deferral certificates will be available at any of your local health centers or any of the outpatient specialist clinics at the public sector institutions. Um, and just to add to ministers, um, with regards to the immunization cards, on Friday I'm having a meeting with all the enforcement agencies to go over aspects um, just like that, what we look out for, and in terms of fraudulent um, productions of cards, what do we do in those instances, the legal officer from the ministry will be present to give guidance to the other agencies as well, which include the city and borough corporations as well as the TTPS. Thank you, CMO. We now go to AZP News. Good morning. We are ready for your questions. Good morning, Suan Wael from acpnews.com. And I believe all of my questions will be directed to the minister. Relating to safe zones again. And a lot of the safe zones are identified as family-oriented places such as restaurants, water parks, theaters, etc. Since many parents may have children under the age of 12, would these families not be at a dis disadvantage and with any provisions in the near future be considered for that unvaccinated age group because we're not sure as to when we're going to get the vaccine for that particular age group as well as does the ministry have enough manpower to ensure that the measures for the safe zones will be complied with throughout the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, so. So I think the word disadvantage um, does not do credit to what we are trying to do. The reason that we have the cutoff age of 12 is that right now there is no vaccine to keep that under 12 cohort safe. So let's not look at it from us versus them with disadvantage. We are trying to keep children under 12 safe. That is the only reason, because right now they cannot be vaccinated. So choices will have to be made, and we don't want to expose our young children under 12 to the possibility. Look, you just heard the CMO say six more cases of Delta. I mean, I don't think the country will forgive us as a government if we allow these children unvaccinated to go into a water park, a cinema, a restaurant, catch Delta, die, and then the question will be posed to us, why did we allow them? So we are erring on the side of caution to keep our children safe. And the advantage to that is that they will hopefully not come out of their little bubbles into a setting which is potentially dangerous to them. On the issue of manpower, we will be using our existing um, public health inspectors who are already on the job doing not this exact type of work, but visiting food places. As you know, they will have the backup power of the TTPS so right now, we think we're in a good position to start this check-in um, of, of establishments. Uh, but thanks very much for those two questions. Thank you, Thank you very much, Minister. We now go to TV6. We're ready for your questions. Good morning. Hi, good morning to the panel. Alicia Boucher from TV6 here. 
Um, my questions are also for the minister. I just wanted a bit of clarity in terms of restaurants. Right now, unvaccinated patrons can walk into restaurants, they can purchase their food, they can leave, well, because no dining is allowed. Should a restaurant decide to be marked as a safe zone, is it now that no unvaccinated patrons would be allowed in to purchase food even if they are not dining? I just wanted some clarity on that. Yeah. And so. in addition... In terms of policing of these safe zones, if we have employees vaccinated, we have patrons vaccinated, is it that police officers entering the establishment also have to be vaccinated? Yeah. Okay. So thanks. So thanks. So the Attorney General did address your question which you asked on Saturday. Um, he, he went into that in full and I think cited case law. So the answer is these inspectors are not required to be vaccinated. On the issue of um, unvaccinated and vaccinated person in a safe zone, a safe zone by concept means anyone inside of that zone in a restaurant, employee, owner, patron must be vaccinated. If the owner of the property decides not to participate in the safe zone, as pertains now, they can do carry out curbside pickup. But if they want to do both, they can simply have their unvaccinated patron collect their food curbside outside. But once you enter that, I'm just using the word bubble because I think we all are accustomed to that now. Once you enter that safe zone bubble as a patron, you are assured that the persons serving you are vaccinated. You are assured that the backroom staff the kitchen staff, the wait staff are vaccinated. So that is the concept of the safe zone, to give you that assurance that in the middle of this pandemic, we can go back to some state of normalcy, that job creation could take place. But if our owner operator decides not to be part of it, as applies now, you can have your takeout, your curbside pickup. If you want to do both, then you do your curbside or take out for the unvaccinated outside as applies now. Okay, thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we now go to Newsday. Newsday, we are ready for your questions. Good morning. My, I have two questions, one for the Minister, one for the CMO. Um, for the CMO, for the people who want to get their medical exemption certificates, who is doing the assessment to say that this person has the condition that they're presented with? If I normally go to a private doctor to treat with my cancer, for example, um, do I have to walk with a letter from them mm -hmm. to the public health institution to be granted that certificate? Um, and then for the minister, the We've received at least one report of a food court saying that they're going to be establishing a safe zone. Um, is this something that is foreseen? Is it that um, unvaccinated people now will not be able to enter a food court to say purchase their food and leave? Thank you. Thank you very much. I will take the second question first. So food courts like in a mall or anywhere else, are not under the direct control of any one owner. So therefore, and it's a very good question you ask, and I raise this with the Honorable Attorney General, food courts will not be allowed to open for sit-down dining at this point in time. In a food court, you buy your food and you go, grab and go. The safe zone is for owner-operated premises. But in a food court, the dining area is a common area, not under the control of any of the franchise establishments or the chicken and chips place or the, or the curry place or whatever. So this does not apply to food courts. And I thank you for raising the issue to lend us some clarity. CMO? Okay. So the, so the medical, yeah. So it's a good example. So you have a patient who is strictly being seen by a an oncologist, a cancer patient in the private sector, there are a few options. So basically, if you go to the public system, 
without any referral, you will possibly have to be referred to a specialist within the public system to be properly assessed and then, of course, given an exemption or deferral. If you have a referral letter from that specialist, which indicates the condition and the medical officer who sees it is satisfied that the conditions are suitable to be granted an exemption and deferral, they can do that as well. So a referral can be given from the private physician to the public sector physician, and they will, of course, do their clinical exam and determine if they need further information, but they may also refer to a similar specialist in the public system to have that verified if they need to do so. And the same thing applies when we deal with disability grants, for example, or public assistance grants. It is a system that is already in place. Thank you very much, CMO and Minister. We now go to IETV. TV. Good morning. Hi, good morning. My name is Rina Mahir from IETV News. I have two quick questions. My first question will go to Dr. Otello. Dr. Otello, are mental health services being offered to students and teachers with the reopening of school effective Monday and where can the services be um, accessed? And my second question would go to the minister. Minister, good day. Um, is government um, planning to address the issue of potential segregation or favoritism as a result of safe zones? Because I know recently the Bar Operators um, Association would have expressed concern as it pertains to this, noting that they are allowed to be reopened for restaurant services, but alcohol is not allowed. They are saying that, you know, other restaurants and other establishments, they, they're not sure if they too are able to serve alcohol. Thank you. Thank you, Bina. Uh, so thank you. I'll take the second question while uh, we wait for Dr. Otello. There is no favoritism. If the regulations are read, there is no alcohol consumption anywhere whether you are a restaurant, a fine dining restaurant, a quick service restaurant, a casual dining restaurant, and or a bar. So the regulations say that clearly. So it's not that alcohol has been allowed in some establishments and not been allowed in some. It's across the board. And the reason being, alcohol all over the world, when people imbibe alcohol, their, their defenses drop, they behave in a particular way, which will spread the virus even more rapidly, even though you are vaccinated. And I will let Dr. Othello talk about what is available at the Ministry of Education for teachers and students. Thank you. Uh, the Student S Support Division of the Ministry of Education currently provides mental health support to students who need such services. When the students' needs exceed that which can be provided in that space, children can be referred to the child guidance clinics located in Port of Spain, San Fernando, and Tobago, where a, a multidisciplinary team of healthcare workers provide the mental health services that they need. I think you asked about teachers as well. And currently, the Ministry of Education allows for teachers to be referred through their employee assistance programs for uh, mental health support when they need it. So both students and teachers do have access to mental health support. Um, I'll just permit me just to, um, to give Bina some, um, some more ease. When one goes to the regulations, regulation 6, Subsection 6, the owner or operator of a business listed in sub-regulation 1A to E and G shall ensure that there is no consumption of alcohol on the premises or within its precincts. So it's not limited to bars. It's a, at this time applicable to anybody operating under the safe zone concept. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And Dr. Othello, we go to Power 102 for your question. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Gregory Mangrini from Power 102, Boom Champions, and Bliss 102.3. Um, the first question is, we've had some reports of persons dying from COVID 
in regular healthcare system and bodies being removed from wards by persons wearing hazmat suits. Um, can you confirm this report? Herbie, could and you, if so, what's being done? Could you, you speak a little louder, louder, please? We're having some Hello. challenges hearing you. Could you repeat your question and just speak a little louder, please? Thank you. Sure, no problem. Is this better? Go ahead. All right. Right. So we've had reports of persons dying from COVID in the regular healthcare system and bodies being removed from wards by persons wearing hazmat suits. Um, can you all confirm these reports? And if so, what is being done to address it? For example, are patients given COVID tests, um, rapid COVID tests prior to or upon their admission to the regular healthcare system as one? And two, I'm not sure if this was addressed previously in terms of how the safe zones will be released. But what happens in the case of teenagers, for example, with no national ID? If they wish to enter safe zones, we know Movie Town is a popular place for teenagers to congregate, but with no national ID to verify the identity. What happens to them? Is there any measure in place to minimize the instances of fraud with persons using vaccination cards that are not theirs? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I will take the the um the second one. What you can do in that case if you don't have a photo ID is simply walk with your vaccination card. Okay? Thank you very much. And CMO will take the other one. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I didn't have any incident in particular that was reported to me from any of these RHAs. But generally speaking, the principle is anyone that is admitted to any of the wards, we have an antigen test in place. We also do PCR at some of the institutions. Of course, if you develop flu-like symptoms while you're in a ward, you are tested as well to ensure that you're not positive. As you know, in, in many hospitals, there were there were cases of COVID-19 positive patients, and as soon as we detect them, we normally send those cases out to, out to one of the parallel healthcare system um, treatment sites, or we isolate them as best as we can within that particular setting, depending on the type of illness they have, If in, in some instances, when they can't physically be moved because of the nature of their illness. Um, so we can, I will look at, if you could give me an idea offline of which regional health authority the incident is alleged to have occurred, we can investigate a little further with that particular RHA and get back to you. Thank you very much. CMO, we go to TTT for your two questions. Good morning, TTT. Good morning, everyone. Kimberly D'Souza from TTT News. Um, I think Alicia actually would have answered my question, but a point of clarification, Minister, because we are getting a lot of questions um, from the Bar Owners Association. So you're basically saying that even if they um, they are identified as a safe zone, but their staff for whatever reason is not vaccinated, or maybe the uh, patrons are not vaccinated, they will still be able to open, but just for takeout and curbside pickup. Is that correct, Minister? If you are not a safe zone, the rules that apply now, that is takeout, will apply. The safe zone concept for bars and restaurants is to allow in-person dining. If you, are, if you decide not to be part of the safe zone um, concept, you can be open for takeout, no alcohol. Okay? No alcohol consumption. Thank you very much, Minister. We go to Guardian Media Limit for a follow-up question. Good morning again. Okay, Minister, would you be in a position at this point to give us an update on those AstraZeneca vaccines that we're supposed to be donating? Have we found a country yet to receive them? Yes, thank you, Rashad. Yes. So the answer is yes. Through the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, um, they have found homes for them. Uh, but I would prefer if the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs divulges that because these are diplomatic efforts, government to government. Uh, but the short answer is yes. Thank you, Minister. AZP News, follow-up question. We are ready. AZP? Okay, so we will go on to TV6. Um, so my I'm question is... Royal. Okay, so Hello? we move to TV6, please. Okay, right. So my question is for the minister, again, just a bit more clarity. Sure. Um, as it, in terms of right now, bars are closed, right? So underneath the current regulations and everything, bars are closed. 
they're being allowed to open under the safe zone if i'm not mistaken so i want a bit of clarity there is it that all bars come monday are allowed to open whether or not they're marked a safe zone the ones that are not under the safe zone would be would allow their patrons to come in pick up their alcohol and leave that's i just need some further clarity yeah thank thank you for that question it's an area i will confer with the attorney general right after because you have raised an important issue but let me just reiterate the issue of safe zones is to allow, and this is what the bars have been asking for, to open up. And I will just confirm with the Attorney General whether they are allowed to open up under, not under the safe zone concept, but to sell alcohol as grab and go. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And finally, we go to Newsday for the follow up question. Good day. Final question is, um, I see in the safe zone regulations, there are penalties for employers and patrons if they're found in breach. What happens if an employee is found in breach when spot checking is going on? Are they also charged? No, it's the employer. So... If we, if we go back to the safe zone slides, maybe we can find the answer there. The employer is responsible for verifying the vaccination status of the employee. If you could find that slide, please, I think it's worth putting back up. But the employer, I have a hard copy here. Let me just double check for you. Yes, so rules for employees must be fully vaccinated, copies of vaccination cards, and all these are responsibilities of the employer. If we go to the next slide, it should be there. Next slide, please. Refines. Next slide, please. So if there's a next one. Breach of TT saves, right. So fixed penalty tickets for breaches under regulations. The breaches will be imposed on the owners or operators, whether the breach is by an employee, as you see there, or a breach by the patron. The patron is also going to pay a fine of $5,000. The safe zone policy puts a lot of responsibility on the owner operator so if the if it is the responsibility of the owner operator to make sure that the employee submits his card and the breach by the patron the owner operator is also fined in addition to the individual patron so i hope that clarifies the issue thank you very much minister You're welcome CMO and dr otello we have come to the end of today's covid 19 update in closing we ask that you continue to protect yourself and your loved ones by practicing the three W's and getting vaccinated. Remember, the COVID-19 vaccines being disseminated through the public health system are all approved by WHO. They are safe, they're effective, free, available and accessible without appointments. These vaccines are available in all five regional health authorities at all 109 public health centers in addition to the advertised vaccination sites. If you haven't received your COVID-19 vaccination as yet, please get yours now. Don't delay. Vaccinate today. Thanks for joining us and goodbye for now.